Hi, everyone. I'm Arielle Poleg. I am a board member of the KLS Foundation. Um, thanks for sticking with us. We are going to be talking about Klein-Levin syndrome in a little bit more depth during this panel. Um, Dr. Mignot will explain what it is. Let me start by introducing everybody. So the KLS Foundation is um, a volunteer-led organization that was started about 30 years ago by two sets of parents whose kids had Klein-Levin syndrome. They wanted to create awareness connect people with one another, and most importantly, encourage and fund scientific research. So first of all, thank you to Dr. Mignot for partnering with us for, I think, 25 years already to try to get to the, the bottom of the mystery of what KLS is. Um, you all know him. For those who are maybe listening online and didn't get the full introduction that, that Claire gave, I'll just explain very briefly who Dr. Mignot is. He is a professor of sleep medicine at Stanford University and the director of the Stanford Center for Narcolepsy. He is a hero to many in this room for discovering the cause of narcolepsy, and he is most certainly a champion to everyone on this stage for um, being the longtime leader of research for Klein-Levin syndrome. Donnie Farber, sitting at the end there, is also a member of the board of directors of the KLS Foundation. He is a former KLS patient. He suffered for, um, 17 episodes of KLS over a 10-year period from the age of 15 to 25. He is now healthy and busy. He is a hedge fund portfolio manager in New York where he lives with his family. He is a budding triathlete and he um, now dedicates a lot of his time on the, on the side as a volunteer to the KLS Foundation. Jenny Grossman sitting next to Donnie is a proud mom of two sons, Cooper, 21, and Charlie, 18. She is also a member of the board of the KLS Foundation and since her son Cooper's diagnosis in 2017, she has made it her mission to be a warrior for the KLS community. With the help of her family and friends and complete strangers, she has raised close to half a million dollars to support research for um, Klein-Levin syndrome. You can <laughs> clap We need up. more money. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh Riley, sitting next to Jenny, is a 26-year-old musician, artist, producer, and recording engineer. He is also a KLS patient who lived with KLS in high school and early college. And he just graduated from the Berklee College of Music in Boston. After needing four years to get an accurate diagnosis, Josh is now committed to raising awareness so that others do not have to go through that. So and I didn't explain who I am, I, other than a member of the board. I also was a KLS patient for 13 years as a young adult. Um, and I today am ha happy, healthy, working. Um, I have three kids, and I live in the Washington area. So I'm going to start by asking Dr. Mignot to speak in a little bit more depth about what KLS is, but more specifically, what KLS isn't. We have been talking a lot over the past weekend, all of us, about rare um, sleep disorders, but KLS is an ultra-rare sleep disorder. So even in the, the world that we're talking about, there's a lot that distinguishes KLS from other, um, other diseases. So Dr. Mignot, can you tell us a little bit about what distinguishes KLS from the other disorders we've been hearing about? Yes, yeah, so the first, the first and most important uh, you know, diagnostic feature for, for KLS is that it's periodic. But periodic is actually a wrong term because it doesn't have any period. It's more like these episodes that are occurring, so people are completely normal between episodes. They just normal, they sleep normally, etc. And then suddenly they become extremely tired, and then they sleep for 20 hours a day. But it's very severe, and it lasts for some a few days, sometimes very long. But as a mean, it's usually about three weeks, two to three weeks, and then suddenly it ends up the same way as as it started relatively quickly, and people are normal. Sometimes they even have a little insomnia. But during the time of, I mean, sleeping beauty, I think it's fine. Uh, it, but during the time they have this careless episode, they cannot do anything. It's not like, oh, I'm a little tired. Oh, yes, oh, I need two cups of coffee. It's just like these people, they, it's, it's so severe, they are confused. Sometimes they are not even normal. They can barely answer a question. Uh, Sometimes, as I mentioned during the text, they even have like behavioral problems, so they can be disinhibited, chanting, uh, they can be very weird. 
uh, when they are awake because they are like very uh, out of, uh, uh, you know, they, they always report they are like in a bubble or in a very severe fog and that reality doesn't seem to be normal. But what's very odd is that it gets better suddenly and then these people can be totally okay for sometimes two weeks, sometimes a month, sometimes six months. That's the worst part. It's absolutely unpredictable. Suddenly, boom, it restarts. And then two weeks, they are again into this episode. So I think the important thing about KLS is when you recognize it is to really be able to reassure the, the patients a little bit on how, how, what it is and how it's going to evolve uh, because usually it gets better with time. And about 10 to 12 years later, that's the median time, you know, people start to have these episodes that are less severe and then it gets better and we call the, the disease burns out and then they don't have the episode anymore. Uh, so, so, it's a new, so that's the definition of KLS. And sometimes it's difficult to uh, differentiate from like people who have like depression, you know, recurrent depression or things like that. But it's still quite different in the sense that people are not depressed. Uh, of course, they can be very frustrated by the episodes. But, and sometimes that can, you can have depression as a complication, but they are not really sad, they, they are weird. You know, that's really the best way to, <laughs> to, to describe it. Yep. Uh, and uh, so that's one important differentiation. And then usually, you know, people with depression, they are not normal in between episodes. I mean, it's not like, except for some of the bipolar conditions, there is a little bit of, of that component. And then, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what else I can, I can say, but you, you, know, you want to make sure it's not bipolar or, or depression. Uh, you want to make sure it's not like a, a problem with confusion. The first time that an, epoch, an episode happens, people usually go to the hospital. It's not like, oh yes, again, I feel a bit tired. It's so severe that the parents, or they're really worried, they think this kid is confused and encephalopathic, so they're often hospitalized and during the hospitalization, they check everything, like MRI, they take blood sample to check that you know, the anemia is not abnormal, that they don't have a metabolic disorder, and everything comes back normal. So people kind of say, What's, what is it? And then it gets better. So the first time, usually, the physician would say, oh, don't worry, he probably had a cold or a weird infection, because sometimes it even starts with a little bit of cold or flu symptoms. And then, now it's finished, you are fine. So they come back home, they say, oh, great. And then six, two months later, boom, it restarts a second time. And that's when you can diagnose Klein Levin, when it starts to reoccur several times. Uh, but it's, it's usually, it's an easy diagnosis to make when you have seen a lot. It's usually more uh, men than women, but not, you know, like 100%, it's like 70%, it's very consistent, and it always starts around childhood to adolescence, and it pretty much always resolved, you know, you know, when you're in the 30s or 35 years old, as I mentioned. Thank you so much, Dr. Mignot. I think that you hit the nail on the head when you said the word weird, because... <laughs> Sorry, uh, it was yeah. not really... Not very scientific. No, but it, it's, you know, that's one of the things about KLS is that it is hard to describe scientifically and each of us in the community have found different words to use to describe it. I've heard people say, it feels like I'm underwater. I've heard people say, it feels like I'm not real. I'm not sure if I'm in a dream or I'm awake. I've heard people say, I feel like I'm separated from the universe. Um, I've heard people say, it feels like I'm on a drug trip. You know, it's, it's definitely weird. And so... Um, we're really lucky to have Josh with us today who can talk to us in his own words about what it feels like to be a Klein-Levin syndrome patient because that's one of the best diagnostic tools we have actually is just listening to patients and understanding what they're experiencing and their symptoms. So Josh, we'd love to hear from you. Yes. Um, oh, sorry, Dr. Mignot, no, go ahead. I just realized there's one other interesting feature is often people don't remember very well what happened during the, the episode. You know, it's like they remember vaguely, like if it was in a dream, but it's not like they ingrain anything. Usually they kind of don't remember what the hell happened for two weeks. <laughs> yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah. yeah. So Josh, so. please, in your own words, tell us a little bit about your own experience and what it felt like for you um, to be a KLS patient. Absolutely. Um, definitely, well, hi, I'm Josh <laughs> Riley. Um, I'm a KLS patient. 
Um, I was undiagnosed for four years um, until I, you know, at that whole time was, was, you know, a lot of confusion of, you know, misdiagnosis. And I hope that, you know, nobody else has to go through that kind of time until they get diagnosed. Um, but yeah, I, when telling people about KLS, I kind of tell them it's, it's pretty much, in my words, a separation of body and soul. Um, my body is, is there. Um, I don't remember anything from when I'm in episodes. Can't control uh, body functions, um, you know, conversations I have, um, living life with KLS, being a completely normal, you know, my version of normal. <laughs> Uh, being a normal kid before uh, it started, you know, being an athlete, being a musician, playing in jazz bands, being social, um, playing with my band in bars in the evenings. Uh, there was no you know, physical limitation to what I was doing, social limitation. I was working. I was in high school. Um, and then all of a sudden, I just checked out one day, and um, I had, you know, as I said, confusion, uh, memory loss, disassociation. I, I remember my first episode, I kept telling my, my family and people around me, I feel like I'm in a dream. Like, I felt like I, I went to sleep one night, and I felt like I was just stuck in a dream that I would wake up, and it would be you know, December 5th, the day that I you know, went into my first episode. Um, and I would be you know, at school. Uh, falling asleep on the bus rides, kids waking me up going, hey, we're, we're getting off the bus now, like, let's go. Um, and me not knowing where I was going, wandering the halls, uh, very irritable. Um, I would, you know, fall asleep in all my classes. Teachers would ask me if I was on drugs. My friends would call my parents and be like, something is definitely not right with Josh. Um, are you guys noticing things? My parents would also notice things. Um, but you know, I'd come home and I would want to go straight to bed and I would sleep all day as much as I could, um, only woken by my parents to, you know, hey, dinner's ready, like, what are you doing? Um, that kind of stuff. And it, you know, it definitely, um, it, it was, it, you can't really communicate what's going on other than I just kept saying, I feel like I'm in a dream. I feel like I'm in a dream. People would be like, what's wrong? I feel like I'm in a dream. Until one day I looked at my mom and I said, I feel like I'm in a nightmare. Um, and then she took me to the hospital. Uh, they, you know, ran a bunch of tests on me and said that I also had encephalitis. Uh, that's what they originally diagnosed me with my first time, my first episode, and um, transported me, emergency transported me to D.C., and we're getting ready to do a bunch more tests on me. And then everything kind of, you know, slowed down and um, stopped, and I went home, and I was normal again. And I went back to everything I was doing. I, I went back to sports, uh, played soccer, music, social. I wanted to go to a military school. Um, I went back to just life. And then it happened again, and my parents rushed me to the hospital. And encephalitis again is happening. Ran all the tests, and everything came back you know, negative. And that you know, kind of started the search of what's wrong. Um, I got misdiagnosed with anxiety and depression, and I tell people, like, I don't really think I had anxiety and depression at the time, um, but I sure as hell do now. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely, like, the anxiety part, you know, it's, it's, I am a few years removed from episodes, um, thank goodness. But, you know, I still live with that fear sometimes. Every now and again, I'll wake up in the morning, I'll be like, ooh, something doesn't feel right. I'm going to sit down for a little while and just make sure that everything's fine, but, um, yeah, it was a lot of, you know, memory loss during that time was one of the biggest things for me. I, I could not function. I could not, you know, do anything really. I couldn't bathe. I couldn't eat. I couldn't go to the bathroom without somebody waking me up um, to, like, guide me to do those things. Um, and as people, you know, as I come out of the episodes, there is a, a time of uh, insomnia after where I would, like, you know, be awake for so long because I'd just been sleeping for, like, 20 days, you know. Um, Josh, what was it like when you did come out of an episode and you needed to get back into school and your relationships in your life and finding out what you missed? What was it like sort of emotionally to re-engage in your life? Overwhelming. It was definitely, uh, I used to know, I, I attempted college many times throughout you know, my journey with KLS. Um, and I would know that, you know, 
I was undiagnosed pretty much the whole time I had KLS. I had one episode uh, diagnosed. And I would know at colleges, I would you know snap back out of the episode, and I would open up my laptop, and there'd be 200 unread emails. And I'd be like, oh, man, it just happened again. Like, I, I couldn't check my phone. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't communicate. I couldn't do anything. So catching back up from all that, extremely overwhelming. I had a, I think it's called an IEP or 504 plan in high school where they gave me incompletes on my grades. I had to drop college, community college course loads um, because I couldn't make it through semesters. Um, I had to give up a full ride Air Force scholarship to a military college because I didn't, you know, at the time I didn't know what was going on, but I didn't feel fit being in the military, uh, you know, with whatever was happening. Um, with relationships with people around me, it, it, there, was, there was recovery uh, because you're very irritable. Uh, I was, um, you know, and I definitely said things and did things that, you know, after an episode I had to be like, oh my goodness. I'm really sorry about that, but I promise it wasn't me. <laughs> Try explaining that to like, you know, somebody who doesn't yeah. know. Like, I didn't even know at the time. So, yeah, it was a very overwhelming transition back into life after these episodes. And you're also, you know, kind of, there's a, like a couple day period where, you know, I wasn't sleeping and also kind of transitioning out of an episode um, is not, I don't call it very smooth. You kind yeah. of go in and out of that KLS feeling. Um, so yeah, it was it's it, it was an uphill battle. I I I you know for years had to just keep trying to push through it all. But yeah, yeah. thank you so much for sharing with us. Yeah, I see on Jenny's face that she's relating. Uh -huh. um, you know, with with KLS because it is so because KLS patients are so incapacitated and really need the caregiving of parents and and family members. It becomes an entire home experience. Everybody in the house, everybody in the family is experiencing KLS together. And um, I'm gonna just let All Jenny right, tell you about go. this. I cry a lot, so bear with me everybody. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try my best to get through this. But as a caretaker of someone that has KLS, it is devastating that you sit and watch your loved ones suffer and you can't do anything about it. And Part of that is that when you're telling doctors and friends and family they don't believe you and you're saying, this is not my child. I'm sorry, I'm going to use you as my boy. Right. But <laughs> I love you and I'm so proud of him because he's a rock star, so I'm super proud of him. But being believed that this is not your child, when you say they're kind, they're sweet, they're smart, they're involved, they love family, they love friends, they love athletics, they're just good people. And this person, because now this is my good son, this is my bad son, <laughs> this is not my child. And when you try to explain to the, you know, the emergency room that this person that's cursing at you and like telling you to go is not my child, he's really polite, he'll hold the door for you. This one's saying, you're not touching me, you're not going near me, and you're just like, what am I doing? And then they're saying, well, they're probably on drugs. And then you're like, well, I'm 99% sure they're not on drugs. And you have to advocate for your loved one because that is the biggest, um, I think, mistake in the emergency rooms. Like I was trying to tell the doctors, when you bring this sick child into this hospital, you're like, there's got to be a brain tumor. There's got to be something wrong with their brain that automatically one day for 15 years, he was a healthy, healthy happy human. And all of a sudden, like a light switch, he's gone. He's evil. He's mean. He's sleepy. He's eating constantly. He's saying inappropriate things. He's just doing things that are not him. You present this child to the hospital, and you expect them to give you an answer and to help you. They do their standard you know, checklist of tests, and then they present you back this sick child and say, they're healthy. There's nothing we can find. They're probably having a nervous breakdown, or they're schizophrenic. You should send them to another hospital, meaning like an, uh, an institution. And People that maybe are not as passionate like I am might say, okay, I'll listen to you and I'll do it. So then this person who is really a good, healthy, kind soul is having an episode where really the only thing to do is let them be and let them sleep and not poke the bear. What happens when you poke a bear? They get agitated, they get annoyed, they're, they need to sleep, and they're constantly being poked and prodded, and they're getting spinal taps and, and EEGs on their head, and it's the exact opposite of what a person in an episode needs, but we're all ignorant at that time, so we, as parents, intentionally annoy this person, and I feel guilty that they're getting more agitated, and I can't help them. So then the hospital says, there's nothing wrong with you, and then they send them home with you. And you're like, well, now what do I do with this person? I gave birth to him, 
and I need to help them, but I'm helpless. I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, I'm devastated, I'm sad. And then I get in touch with a doctor named Dr. Mignot, and then I beg him, you cannot stop trying to fight and find a cure for my child, who now, you're all my children, and you're all my family, because we're part of a club that no one ever signed up for, but we're in it, and we have no choice because maybe it could be passed on to our loved ones, and we don't, we don't know, so we are trying desperately. And myself, I made a vow to my child that I will be part of finding the cause and cure for KLS. I will not stop advocating for everyone in this room and those watching and those that are gonna come down the pipeline and be diagnosed with it. Emergency rooms need to be educated. I myself, after Cooper got diagnosed, and we were one of the lucky ones because I had a friend that actually studied under Dr. Davinsky at NYU who knew of Klein-Levin syndrome. As of my connection, we got him in in three weeks. Cooper snapped out of his episode after 20 days, and then about the day he went to see Dr. Davinsky, he went in his ep second episode. So I knew something was wrong. I advocated. I took diligent notes. You know your child. You know your loved one. Be their advocate. Take diligent notes so you could present them to the doctor. Have them in a very organized way so that it's not a lot of stuff. But you can say these are the top symptoms that they're doing or the constant things they're doing. And um, fast forward, my son got diagnosed. I went back to the hospital that told me my son needed to go to a mental institution. And I said, we need to have a talk because I want to protect other children. They're going to come to your hospital. And people are not like me. And um, I don't know, I felt helpless, so I felt like this is what I could do. Advocating for my son was to go and educate that emergency room. And then I somehow, because I did fundraisers for my son, which ultimately raised money for research, a person, because I was talking, telling my story at a gym, heard me, came over, wrote a check for $250, just feeling sorry for me because there's nothing I could do for my child, but we can give the money to a researcher who can try to help us, um, got me into Atlantic Health Morristown Hospital, and I spoke in front of a room of about 20 doctors there. I don't know what I'm saying, but I'm just talking, and I'm just like saying, here's the deal, people. You're going to be presented with these people that are saying, them, this is not my child. Believe them. Hear them. We are the ones that live with it day in and day out. You see, and you look in your books, and you, you learn about it for like an hour and a half in your, in your sleep study section of being a doctor, but there's more to it, and you have to listen to us. So as a mom, as a caretaker, as an advocate, as a board member, I am here to say it's a sucky job, all of it, because I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in this club, but I am here, and I won't stop fighting for you. I know it sucks, but I'm with you, and I feel your pain, and I feel everyone's pain in here. Being rare stinks, um, but don't give up, because there is hope. There are people, and there are good people out there that are trying to fight for us. Um, and they're doing the best they can, but we need to aid them with what they need, which is blood, blood, blood. So anyone that hasn't donated blood, we got a phlebotomist inside. Thank you for donating blood. And registries where we can combine information is so vital for all of us. So we as a foundation have our own registry that we fought to create and we raise money for and we have it. So I want people to donate their information, donate their blood, um, and donate your time because raising awareness and talking and sharing your story, whether it's to a news, to a um, a channel, we did a Fox 5 piece together. I didn't want to do it, but we did it. He was brave. I took on him. I'm like, he's the one that had it and is sharing his story. So I'm going to share my story of my journey. And um, just raising awareness is so vital to actually trying to get to a cause and cure. So I got you, Max. Thank you so much, Jenny. I didn't cry. I didn't cry. I did good. I did good. Jenny is a powerhouse, obviously, <laughs> and we're all very lucky to have her on our team. Um, Dr. Mignot, I want to ask you another question about the rarity of KLS, which is what made you personally um, interested in taking such a deep dive into something so unusual and so little understood? And what, um, what keeps you going with the, with the study of KLS? I'm wondering if you don't have like a telepathic ability like your father. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. You know, I, one thing that I want to point out is Okay, KLS is considered a rare disease. That is true. But everyone has to realize that rare diseases can lead to much more than just the disease itself. You know, like, for example, narcolepsy. You know, we thought it's not a very common disease, but we found that it was due to this orexin 
deficiency. And now there is these drugs, you know, that replace orexin, that are of course going to help people with narcolepsy, but they're going to help a lot of people with idiopathic hypersomnia, other problems. And the same way, I think, uh, Klein living is very unique because you have this very strange state that kind of seems to fluctuate, and you really never really completely know what you're going to find once you really understand the disease. But I can guarantee you that it's going to help people with KLS, but it's going to help all kind of other people who have other things that we don't really understand that will be uh, influenced by what we find. Uh, we just don't know yet, you know? It, I think uh, like rare disease can be a model for understanding a lot more than, than just the conditions that you study. I, at least I believe strongly about that. And uh, I mean, you know, I was of course very moved by your discussion, but, and I, I, I think imagine the number, of, if, if you had KLS, only one episode, probably some people, because we, usually you have many episodes, but out of all the people with KLS, there must be some that have only one episode. So, you know, then you will have been diagnosed with, not, with just an encephalopathy and you will have been gone away. There might be a lot, it might be a lot more frequent than what we think. You know? I agree. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we just don't know. There might be, imagine if you have, the, I mean, that's one problem we have in narcolepsy already. If you have narcolepsy and depression or you have like a mental condition, it's often very difficult to, to know what is due to narcolepsy or what is due to something independent. So we really need biological markers because I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, if people were completely healthy in their mind when they started Klein Levin, some people really get you know, depressed having Klein Levin or get other problems. I mean, because it's not a piece of cake to go through this. No. And uh, so I think uh, we really need to be able to understand the broader spectrum of KLS. And that's a little bit hard because I see a lot of patients in my practice also that sometimes have a KLS, but also some other things. I, I'm, you know, they may have a little bit of psychiatric disorders, but I still feel that client living is the most important. And, uh, you know, these patients could also benefit from what we are going to learn. But what's difficult is when you do research, you want to be focusing on the pure cases right. because otherwise it contaminates a little bit your research. But then at the end, you may realize that it has a much broader spectrum than just the disease you study. Thank you. And that overlap is you know, why we're here as part of the Hypersomnia Foundations Conference. And so thank you for including us and for having us. And um, you know, for those of us that we, as the KLS Foundation, haven't met yet, we're delighted to know you and to partner with you and to hopefully collaborate so that we can find answers that help more than just one tiny community because together we, we can find more answers. Um, Jenny, what did you want to add? Yes, I totally veered off my topic and what I was supposed to say. So okay. I all good. realized that what I was supposed to also remind you guys as caretakers is that we need to take care of ourselves. Um, we need to try to talk to people that get what we're talking about, um, whether it's through Facebook, whether it's through whatever it may be. But also, um, I know my husband suffers with it in a different way than I do. He shuts down completely and will not talk to anyone. I'll maybe text people because no one understands what I'm going through, but like physically going for a walk or removing myself from the situation is important to like even just get light on my face because it is a very depressing situation watching the person that you love suffer and feeling helpless and hopeless. So you do have to take care of yourself as the caretaker first because if you're not well and healthy, it's not an easy job because there were days I didn't want to change my clothes or get up and shower and do anything because I was angry and my husband would beg me and I'd say, nope, nope, not eating today. He didn't eat, I'm not eating. And you know, I want to feel and empathize and sympathize with him. And then I'll be like, okay, I have another child because there's other people in the family and I have responsibilities to everybody. So as a caretaker, you have to try to take care of yourself first and foremost so that the people around you um, are taken care of. And then with the actual person that's going through the episode, you need to kind of listen to what they're saying and make them feel they're okay and also remind them that they're going to come out of this. That is the most important, I think, 
tool that you can use in your toolbox. And this young man was the person that reminded my family, and I will be that person for you and your family. It took my son six months to come out of his last episode, which was daunting as every day would pass and pass and pass. And he would, I'm going to curse, so excuse my language, but, and I'm sorry if I'm not allowed to curse, but he would <laughs> tell my husband, I promise you Cooper will come out. And I'd be like, he's a fucking liar. He's not coming out because it's another day and it's another month and it's another month. And as the months are passing, I was like, how can he be so sure? And then he was right. And it wasn't in the time frame I would have liked, not that I want any time frame, but he did come back. So Talking to people is very um, important to your mental health, and whether it's a psychiatrist, psychologist, whomever it is, talk. It's the best gift you can, best gift you can give yourself is to talk to someone and share because um, getting it out is so important. So I'm true. sorry. So that's, sure. no, that's thank why you. I was supposed to come. Thank up you. There thank you. And say all that. Um, there, there are two more really important things that I want to hit on, and we don't have too much time, so I'm going to turn to Donnie. Um, Donnie, can you tell us a little bit about a, a very different piece of the rare disease experience, which is advocacy and self-empowerment? Other than suffering through what we're all experiencing and connecting with one another, what else can we do? Tell me about the experience of the Klein-Levin syndrome community in getting organized and in becoming a foundation and in trying to help others. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so to set the stage on, on ag advocacy, um, you know, because Klein-Levin syndrome is so rare, because no one knows about it, nor the impact that it has on people's lives, you know, because of all that, we need to advocate for ourselves, because if we don't do that, no one else will. So adv advocacy really plays um, a critical role in the Klein-Levin Syndrome Foundation in advancing our mission and being able for us to, to have an impact. So before I dive into the, the question, um, I'll begin um, and put context around the, the Klein-Levin Syndrome Foundation uh, by sharing our roots. You mentioned it in uh, the beginning, but we were started uh, 25 years ago by two uh, KLS families, two sets of parents whose children had KLS, and at the time there was very little available information on KLS, and they were just desperate to try to make a difference. And fast forward two decades now, um, where we are today, we're still um, an all-volunteer organization made up of uh, KLS patients and families, but we're now in our second generation of leadership, and we have uh, come a long way uh, from our infancy and through advocacy, we've done a lot of tangible things to, to really make a difference. So let me give you a couple examples. Um, I'll repeat a few things that were, that were mentioned earlier on the panel. Um, but the first example is community support. Um, we have, uh, our advocacy efforts have really brought our KLS community together. Um, I had my KLS episodes in the 1990s uh, before there was uh, the internet. And it was really hard to find um, other people that also knew um, about KLS. And as I'm sure this room can appreciate, you know, having a rare uh, disorder that is difficult to understand, um, that no one else really knows about, um, can feel really helpless and isolating. And so we at the KLS Foundation, you know, we've made it our mission to um, try to help people find others whose lives are also impacted by KLS. And so these connections um, between KLS patients and families, um, they've really provided our, um, our community members um, much needed emotional support. And um, Ways we've done this, just quickly, um, through support groups that we have on, on social media, through conferences like this and others we've held in the past. Um, we have fostered mentor relationships between um, individuals who are still experiencing active KLS episodes and individuals who no longer have active cases. Um, th so through those type of efforts, we've really tried to um, build community support and will continue to do so. Um, the second thing that is worth mentioning um, is raising awareness. Um, we're constantly trying to tell our KLS stories to the outside world, to the community, to people outside of the KLS community. And that's carried real weight given 
how rare KLS is and given that people don't know about it. And so whether it's been on um, TV shows that Jenny mentioned or podcasts that I've done with Ariel or newsprint articles or earned media, um, we've made a wide effort to uh, we made an effort to widen the circle of people that are familiar with KLS. And whether it's teachers or um, athletic coaches or employers, you know, these people need to know about KLS and it's our job to educate them um, because by doing so, by increasing the number of people that are knowledgeable about the disorder, um, we've really elevated the outside world to know about the challenges that people face when they have KLS and to try to initiate support programs to improve their lives. Um, the third piece is um, of advocacy that is, that is worth mentioning uh, centers on our research program. Um, 20 years ago, um, there was no one, um, no one trying to understand or study KLS. And as a startup organization, that really wasn't acceptable to us. We knew firsthand the, um, the toll that KLS has uh, on people's lives. And so we started our own research program to try to advance the scientific understanding um, that we have on KLS. And as Dr. Mino shared, um, there's current um, studies being taking place currently at, under his leadership at, um, at the Stanford Sleep Center. And it goes without say that we are extremely um, grateful for the partnership and for your commitment. But we as a foundation also understand that a partnership is a two-way street and the foundation plays uh, an important role in driving research. And so some of the ways that we have done that um, through the fundraising that Jenny has mentioned, we are the primary funder of most uh, KLS research. Um, we've set up the, um, alongside Stanford, the logistics and the processes to, um, to get blood samples to Stanford, which is vital for any research to be conducted. Um, and we're doing the, the, we have a blood draw here today. So if you're in the audience and haven't participated at Stanford yet, um, please find us afterwards. And if you're listening um, to this on recording, um, also reach out when you can and we'll help you through that process. And then the, the final piece of research that, that we do through our advocacy work is we're, we're constantly trying to find new KLS research interest um, in an effort to find breakthroughs. So, if there's people that are sleep researchers or new to KLS, have an interest in, K have an interest in it, um, we should talk. Um, <laughs> and then the final few things that, um, you know, advocacy um, that we do to try to empower ourselves um, legislatively. Over the past year, we successfully lobbied Congress to um, have language in last year's appropriations bill. Um, encouraging the NIH to, um, to include KLS when they are conducting research on sleep disorders. Um, Jenny mentioned our patient registry. Um, that collects both general and disease-specific information on Klein-Levin syndrome. And the goal there is twofold. One, referencing back to community support um, by having an accurate list of patients and caregivers and doctors we can do a much better job facilitating engagement and connectivity. And then two, by collecting the critical pieces of information like triggers and symptoms, we can um, continue to drive our research program and disease understanding forward. Um, the last and final piece is the fundraising. Um, it, it, you know, the, I mentioned the KLS Foundation self-funds um, most of our research, but it goes way beyond that. The, the registry that we have um, was created through our fundraising efforts. Our communication strategy with our community is possible through our fundraising initiatives. So um, the point that I'd like to make is that for um, a small organization like ours, you know, every dollar makes a real impact. Um, and then you mentioned earlier um, uh, the Hypersomnia Foundation. I'll just wrap up by saying that 
you know, a lot of the success that we have had is by a few of us really rolling up our sleeves and trying to get stuff done. But it wouldn't be possible without a, a little organization like ours without having allies. And so I'll just wrap up by, um, by thanking you, Claire, and, and the rest of the Hypersomnia Foundation. Um, just want to um, thank you for the opportunity and platform today. And uh, we appreciate it. So thank you. Yay. Thank you. One more Good job. I know we're out of time, but can I ask Dr. Mignot one more question? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. So I want to, if we can, end on, a, on an optimistic note, because you've heard a lot about the challenges um, and the struggles of living with Klein-Levin syndrome. But there's also good news, which is that Dr. Mignot was on the case. Um, can you tell I have a toddler who watches Paw Patrol? So um, can you tell us, just briefly, in whatever amount of time we have left, what is, what is the current status of your research? Where are you hoping to go next? Um, and why should we all be, be hopeful about the work that you're doing? OK. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I'm a researcher. So as a researcher, I really don't want to oversell my stuff because, you know, you don't want to disappoint people. And I'm a little optimistic by nature. So often, I kind of need to tape myself a lot, <laughs> you know, to avoid, you know, being too optimistic. But it's true that we had, you know, some very interesting findings that I, I think uh, we can pursue. One of them is we found this very strong genetic load. Like we really discovered that that there is definitely genes that predispose to KLS, and they are reproducible. So if you take like a whole set of KLS patients, and then you calculate the risk based on all these genes, and then you repeat it, it's very repeatable. So that just confirms that KLS is a real kind of entity. You know, it's not like made up. You know, it's, it's really something that you can reproduce and maybe understand by having more genetic, uh, understand what the genes are doing on the brain. And then we have this very exciting finding with measuring the proteins, you know, in the blood samples of patients with KLS, where, you know, by measuring like 50 proteins out of thousands, we can kind of get a composite score that seems to predict KLS reasonably well, even outside of episode. I mean, it's not like fantastic, but it's surprisingly good. I would, I would have expected we couldn't find it and we could reproduce it like, so that it has a, you know, like maybe 80% you know, accuracy kind of. So it can, you know, diagnose or exclude KLS with a relatively a good start for, for differentiating. There is some prediction. And I'm going to be a bit disappointing for the next step. I'm sorry, Ariel, <laughs> because as a researcher, I'm just awful. But I just don't want to walk on, on shaky foundations. So the first thing I want to do is I'm so happy about this finding that I just want to make sure that they're correct before going to the same next step. I'm sorry. I'm just a so worse enemy to myself. But we should wait a week. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jenny time. That's perfect. That's I'll, give right. him, I'll give him a week. I'll so give him a week. If you give me more blood samples, you know, we'll you be hear, able... You heard it out of his mouth. He yeah, needs blood. That's true. We'll be able to replicate this, and then I will feel totally confident, and then I can go to the next step. Uh, because, you know, I'm, in my career, you know, I've, I, it's very important as a, as a scientist to be an, a septic. Skeptic, you have to be a honorable skeptic. It's too good to be true. That's not possible. And that's a little bit where I am. I'm actually finding, I found some stuff that I saw that too good to be true because Klein Levin is kind of a complicated thing. I, w I didn't really feel that we'll find proteins that will be so predictive, to be honest. So I always have to think there's something wrong. I need to make sure this is right before I just move forward. With what you just said, though, your blood and predicting and repeating in the KLS individuals, you also need the placebos to, oh, to, yeah. to actually confirm that it is happening, correct? So the placebos are Thank to control. Thank you, Jenny. Yes. So one of the worst things that happened in research, I can tell you, it's always easy to get blood from patients with narcolepsy, patients with KLS, whatever, but controls. Unfortunately, controls are super important because it's very easy. Oh, you know, all the KLS, they give me all the, all the blood sample now. But then I don't have controls. So I say, oh, I don't have control. So I'm, oh, I'm going to take people from the lab. 
But you know, the lab is not the same as here. It's not like the same temperature, it's not the same light system, it's not the same time of the day, it's not the same people. And then you get biased because your controls have not been taken in exactly the same circumstances, shipped to Stanford exactly the same way. So I can tell you that 90% of, of, of studies fail because their controls are not good. So controls are really essential. And so, and for example, we have younger children. It's always difficult to get younger children blood, you know, because, you know, if you're parents, I mean, ask my wife, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you will never give a blood sample of your child, you know, for research. It's very difficult, especially a normal child. And yet, you know, if we don't have the controls, we just can't do the research. The research will always be flowed. It's only when you have, and for disease that's rare, like KLS, you actually need more controls to make sure that your test is specific, you know? And so that's my pitch for controls. So we will uh, do everything we can to get the word out yeah. and to make sure that you have the samples that you need. And that's such a simple thing that we can all do. So Dr. Mignot, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you all for listening at home and here. And um, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you.